Hey World Civilization, Mr. Lassiter here with you. And in this video, we're going to take a close look at 19th century European revolutions. Got a lot of review in this video. Um, if we take a look at the video goals questions, we're going to review the Congress of Vienna. Uh, we're going to look at um, conservatism, liberalism, and nationalism real quickly. And then we'll spend a good amount of time on revolutions in 1830 and 1848. So let's start with our review of the Congress of Vienna. If you recall, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, European nations such as Prussia and Austria uh, and France and Great Britain uh, get together uh, and Russia to establish a balance of power in Europe. They check the power of France, establish some independent territories, um, and, and divide up other lands. Uh, we did this in an activity in class together. Um, most of these countries wanted to reestablish the conservative order, bring back uh, the principle of legitimacy, the idea that monarchs or kings and queens should be ruling in these territories and not uh, these republican radical governments like France had developed uh, or a government like Napoleon's where it's a, a dictator who was just a regular citizen. Um, and so they succeed in redrawing the lines of Europe and establishing this idea of conservatism. Now, if you recall, conservatism is based on tradition and social stability. They hated the idea of revolutions, uh, and they really didn't like the idea of representative governments that uh, gave lower classes more say. Pretty much European nations, the big ones, Prussia, Austria, uh, Russia especially, they will be considered conservative nations. Britain, not so much. Um, but these conservative nations basically agree to intervene and crush any rebellions that they see going on within other countries in order to keep this uh, old way of governing intact. Now this is in contrast to new forces and new ideologies which are developing in Europe. The ideas of liberalism, uh, and nationalism. Liberalism was heavily influenced by the Enlightenment. It believed people should be as free as possible. It uh, believed in written constitutions, etc. Um, nationalism also develops in this time period as they, people start to become aware of common traditions and customs uh, within their individual nations. And in this case, we're using nation to refer to uh, people that share uh, common uh, cultures, not necessarily in the sense of a country like we think of it today. Both nationalism and liberalism sought change, uh, and so they oftentimes are strong allies in spreading each other's ideas, but in some cases, um, liberal thinkers and nationalist thinkers uh, won't be able to get together. So these forces combine uh, into a series of revolutions that we see in the 19th century, starting in 1830 in France, when liberals overthrew uh, the, the absolute monarch um, that had been put back on the throne by the Congress of Vienna. And in the July Revolution, they put in, uh, in place a constitutional monarchy, kind of like Britain had. Uh, Belgium is another place in 1830. They, they see what's going on in France, and they rebel uh, against the Netherlands to become an independent state. Uh, there are rebellions in Prussia, or excuse me, in Poland, uh, but Russia conquers those and, and crushes those. Um, and Italy starts to fight back against Austrian rule. If you remember, uh, northern Italy was given to Austria in the Congress of Vienna, as Poland was given to Russia. Um, so early seeds of rebellion here, um, and most of these are put down, not necessarily in France, but elsewhere. Um, but these forces of liberalism and nationalism, as you see here in bold, would combine once again to, uh, to uh, lead to bigger revolutions in 1848. And this map shows you some of the chaos that went down between 1847 and 1848. Uh, you can see on this map not only revolutionary centers um, and places where major revolutionary uh, activity occurred, but you can also see where troop movements went, including, if you notice, 
uh, if you follow my mouse here, Russian intervention into Austria, which we will talk about. So these revolutions begin where revolutions usually do in France, where we see economic problems in 1846 cause the people uh, to become very upset with their government and with their uh, constitutional monarchy. So they overthrow King Louis Philippe uh, in 1848, and a new republic is established in France, what's called the Second Republic. Uh, it, was, it also established universal male suffrage, meaning all men are going to be allowed to vote in France. But more and more bloody fighting breaks out um, in this, and so it's, it's a devastating revolution in terms of people killed. And, um, but ultimately, we see a new constitution written in France, and it is a success. Monarchy is done away with, and the Second Republic is established with a president in France. Now, other countries are going to look at France and they're going to see what's going on and it's going to inspire revolutions once again in their, in their areas. We'll look first at Germany. After hearing about France, Germans began to push for their own reforms within the German Confederation. In 1848, uh, cries for change caused many German rulers and these little principalities to promise constitutions and more freedoms to the people. And an assembly is established in order to push for these changes. But ultimately, rulers don't want to accept these liberal reforms. Uh, they feel like it will weaken their own power. And so they simply refuse to accept it. And this revolution sort of falls flat. It's a failure. In Austria, we see huge revolts come all over this country. Austria was a multinational state, meaning it had many different nationalities in it. it Hungarians and Czechs and Slovaks and Germans and Italians um, and uh, all these different groups began kind of pining for their own independence, their own self-government. And so there start to be in the cities, uh, multi multiple cities around Austria, uh, demonstrations. And this leads to a guy named Clemens von Metternich who was very important in establishing the Congress of Vienna, he's going to get fired. Um, in Vienna, actually, rebels take control of the capital city, and they demand a liberal constitution in what was once a very proud, uh, uh, authoritative monarchy. Um, Hungarians, are in, in their region, uh, revolt, and the government kind of decides to let them have a little bit of self-government. But then elsewhere in the Austrian Empire, Czechs want their own um, government too when they see the Hungarians get a little bit of self-rule. Austrian troops, they're going to crush the Czech rebellion in Prague. They're going to defeat rebels in Vienna. But for the Hungarian Revolution and the Hungarians wanting more and more independence, uh, Austria turns to Russia, and Russia sends in about 100,000 troops to come in and help them defeat the Hungarian Revolution. Because if you remember, back in the Congress of Vienna, these countries agreed to help each other out if uh, monarchies were in danger. So these revolutions ultimately fail. The Austrian Empire will survive and last a little bit longer. In Italy, we see nationalist revolutions as well. If you remember, Italy was divided up by the Congress of Vienna. Um, two of the states, which are controlled by Austria, rebelled against the Austrian Empire. There were early successes, but ultimately they are defeated again. Um, and so these Italian states, which want independence, uh, are going to have to wait just a little bit longer. They're going to have to wait until about the 1870s. The old order, this conservative order, will stay in place. We see nationalist movements elsewhere uh, in, um, in Europe. For example, in Greece we see it, uh, in rebellions against the Ottoman Empire. Serbia will rebel against the Ottoman Empire. So these rebellions just start to pop up all around Europe as different individual groups want independence. This is going to play a huge role later on in this course. So keep in mind these ideas of liberalism and nationalism against the old order of conservatism. Just as a wrap-up, 
remember throughout Europe in 1848, popular revolts started, um, and they were pushing for liberal constitutions and governments. Most of these end up not being successful, and one reason is because moderate liberals and radical revolutionaries end up disagreeing. And even though they kind of agree that they need to overthrow the system, they can't agree what should take place afterwards. Uh, and so conservatives went out in most places. It does not mean that liberalism and nationalism disappears. It will continue to influence events in Europe uh, much further on. Here are those video goals questions again. Uh, if you need more information, go to the reading that you will find in your PLP. Um, and feel free to ask questions if you have any. That's it, guys.